Coming up on Tech News Weekly, how to win online sweepstakes like the pros, who are called sweepers, by the way. How a little town in Texas bet on cryptocurrency and at least so far lost. Uh, how to bring IoT into your rental home. And we get to know Micah Sargent, my future co-host here on Tech News Weekly. All that more coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 91, recorded Monday, July 15th for Thursday, July 18th, 2019. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Cashfly. Give your users the seamless online experience they want. Empower your site or app with Cashfly's CDN and be 30% faster than the competition. You can learn more at twit.cashfly.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Tech News Weekly. This is the show where we talk each and every week with people who are making and breaking some interesting tech news stories online. I'm Jason Howell, and uh, we've got some really awesome interviews lined up for this week, so let's get started. Online sweepstakes may seem like they are too good to be true, that maybe the odds of actually winning anything of any real value are so low that it's not worth entering. And for the casual everyday sweepstakes entrant, that might actually be the case. But some people have shown that there are tangible ways to beat the odds. Joining me is Zach Crockett from The Hustle, who wrote about a few women who are defying the online sweepstakes odds. Welcome to the show, Zach. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you on. Uh, sweepstakes, obviously, like they, they weren't created with the internet. They've been around long before the internet actually existed. How has the internet kind of changed the landscape uh, in the past 20 years? Yeah, so sweepstakes have been a part of American culture, you know, since the 1950s. Um, and it used to be really hard to enter. You used to have to send in these postcards or maybe even write a jingle for a company or, or perform some kind of task. And uh, in, the, in the new digital age of sweepstakes, it's just, it, it's expedited the whole process of entry. So you can there's a whole system of, um, you know, filling out hundreds of forms in one day, or um, there, there are kind of some ways to, to game the system have emerged in recent years. And there is obviously there are people who have figured this out and who are uh, putting it, you know, to the extreme test. Um, how much time, how much energy is actually spent? You call them sweepers. This must be like an, an industry term for people who are, are doing this all the time. Like, is there time and energy? Is, is the payoff worth it in the end? Because it sounds like it could be a lot of work. Maybe the Internet makes it a little bit easier, though. Sure. Yeah. So in the United States, uh, these these avid uh, sweepstake enters are called sweepers. In the UK, they're called compers. Um, and uh, if you go online, it's just like a, a massive community. There's underground Facebook groups and forums and newsletters. Uh, hundreds of people uh, kind of partake in this art form of, of gaming the odds. And people think of sweepstakes as these random things that are just a matter of chance. But um, some people claim that they are totally a, a skill-based activity. Um, so I spoke to a, a number of women who have spent a lot of time coming up with various systems of trying to kind of game the odds of entering these contests. Um, I would say on average, uh, you know, the, the average sweeper probably makes somewhere around a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars a year. Uh, but there are, there's a really small percentage of sweepers who, actually make a substantial living off of doing this. Wow. And it's not just, you know, making money because some sweepstakes might have a cash reward, but a lot of these are going to be prizes and everything. And Hey, I would, I would love a trip to Bermuda uh, every once and again. So <laughs> uh, maybe it's worth it to, to take the time to do this. You wrote about a couple of different approaches. You wrote about a qualitative approach and then a quantitative approach. And you actually have, you know, one woman that you feature for, for each of those categories uh, in your article. It was pretty fascinating. Um, I guess, Talk about the differences between the two. Are, do, are they applicable to different types of sweepstakes? Or are they just different strategies? Sure, yeah. So online, there are a number of different types of sweepstakes. Um, the one that I call qualitative is uh, any kind of sweepstakes where you can kind of just influence the person who's uh, picking the winners. So some contests are 
you might need to retweet something or, or post a photo on Instagram. And those sweepstakes, uh, obviously, there, there are more ways to show your personality or distinguish yourself. And a lot of times the, the people choosing the winners aren't doing it randomly. They're looking for the person who exhibits the best characteristics that they want in a winner. Um, so one woman I spoke to, Diana Koch in the UK, uh, has been doing this for, for 15 years now. And she's used it to win a brand new car, uh, $40,000 in cash. She's won trips to Tokyo, Barcelona, Brazil, uh, front row tickets to London Fashion Week. Uh, nice. A washing machine, refrigerator, just uh, <laughs> in total, probably three hundred thousand dollars worth of of uh, various uh, prizes. And and um, then of course she has to find a place to put all this stuff and, uh, <laughs> and ask herself, man, did I need another washer? Or maybe I do. I yeah, uh, it's actually it's it's not uncommon for for people to sell these prizes oh, too sure. uh, if 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 they win something they don't want. Um, but but then the the other side of this, the, the quant side is. There's a whole community of people who enter competitions that are just a matter of filling out a form online. So it's just a very, very basic form, name, address, email. Um, and obviously, you know, hundreds of thousands of people enter these contests, these dream vacation contests, things like that. But there's a subset of people who've come up with this ridiculous system of expediting the process so that they're able to fill out two or 300 of these forms in a matter of in maybe an hour. Um, they use uh, aggregators, which are sites that compile all of these different sweepstakes. And then they use all the software like auto form fillers and, um, you know, uh, various mechanisms to, to just expedite the process of filling out these forms. And that's also a very successful strategy. Uh, one woman I spoke to want to meet and greet with Sting by doing this and, uh, probably around three or $400,000 of additional prizes as well. <laughs> wow. And so, and I mean, at that point, you know, what you're talking about, it's a sheer numbers game, right? Like there aren't, there aren't that many people that are going to take the time and maybe it isn't a whole lot of time. It sounds like it would be a whole lot of time to fill out two, three, 400 questionnaires. God, filling out just one just makes me, you know, it just seems like a bridge too far for me. But if there's software that helps you through this, it's truly a numbers game, right? If you put in on 400, you're likely to win something at some point, right? Yeah, it's 100% a numbers game. You're, you're totally right. It's, it's, it's still a game of chance, but what they're doing is uh, increasing their odds by filling out as many forms as they can. They, they find competitions where you can enter multiple times. They uh, find all these, these random ways to game the system, um, and, and it works. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, I had an experience a couple of years ago where, you know, every once in a while, whoever you happen to be subscribed to their, you know, their mailing list or whatever, a, an audio company that I follow called IK Multimedia had some sort of like an anniversary celebration. Submit your email address. You might win, you know, a thousand dollar package of our software, blah, blah, blah. We'll choose three winners. And very randomly, it, well, it seemingly to me anyways, out of nowhere, I got the email that said that I had won. And it was, you know, it was 100% legit, but it was just one of those things that was like, I just didn't think people actually win these things because anytime I've ever done it, I've, you know, I've never won anything. So it kind of, uh, it opens your eyes to the possibility of, wait a minute, if it is truly a numbers game and you have the time great. Maybe you can win more things that actually mean something to you and have, have some monetary value. What are some of these tools? Cause you talk a little bit about the tools that they're using, or maybe even just the communities that people are, are checking so other people can uh, get started. Um, yeah, there, so, um, there, there are a number of like auto form fillers on the internet. If you search like auto form filler, um, a variety like of companies will apps. come up. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, I don't want to name any because I don't yeah. want to seem like I'm promoting any. But gotcha. Um, it you know, um, tons of sweepstake forums. Um, I, I I win contests is a is a great site, and they also the the proprietor of that website has won over a million dollars in sweepstakes himself. He's one of the kind of gurus of the sweepstakes space in the United States. Um, but uh, you know, the other thing about this community is it's it's unusual in the, in the sense that it's very, it's very welcoming. Um, even though you would think that all these people would just be kind of ferociously competing with each yeah, other, right, but right. they're, they, sh they share strategies with each other and they want to encourage each other to win. They celebrate each other's wins. You go on these forums and 
you know, they're, they're rallying behind the guy who wanted a $20,000 fishing boat or I know a trip to Japan. They, they, they get very excited for one another and they're more than willing to share their tips. Oh, that's interesting. All right. So that site was iwincontest.com for anyone that wants to go mm -hmm. and check that out. Um, and then of course there are the brands that are doing these. This is a question that I've often had, which is like, what exactly do they get out of it? Sure. They get a little bit of a promotion out of it, but how do you, how do you actually put a, a number, you know, quantify the, the value of this? What, what, what are, what is the perspective of brands on this? Sure. You know, um, companies aren't doing these out of the kindness of their heart. Obviously it's a, it's a business decision, uh, through and through. Yeah. Um, but generally, you know, you get a prize and the company gets exposure, sales, potential customers. Um, there's an example I gave in the piece, uh, last black Friday, Kohl's, the department store ran a, a sweepstakes on Twitter where they gave out 20, $20, uh, a thousand twenty dollar gift cards to random people who retweeted their tweet, and uh, so that contest cost twenty grand. It's twenty times a thousand. Um, what is the value of that for them? So marketers have estimated that one retweet, one branded retweet, is worth approximately twenty dollars um, in exposure and potential sales to a company. Um, and this particular tweet got eleven thousand retweets. So if you do a rough calculation, 11,000 times $20, they're getting about $220,000 of value um, out of a, a promotion like that. So that's more than 10 times the amount that they paid to put on the contest. Another byproduct is something that's called user-generated content, which basically anytime you run a promotion on social media, um, you're going to have a ton of people tweet about it, uh, talk about it. You're going to generate um, a bunch of basically free content around your brand. And that's worth a tremendous amount of money to these companies. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. No kidding. Um, interesting stuff for anyone that's aspiring to get into sweeping. You have, you have a few tips there at the end that I think were pulled from some of the, some of the women that you talked to. How sure. about, I, I guess uh, name a couple of tips for people who, who really want to get started. Sure. So one, one interesting thing to keep in mind is the harder a contest is to enter, the easier it is to win. Um, so contests maybe that require a photo or, oh, yeah. um, so something that requires a little bit of effort on your end. Uh, generally, the more a contest requires to enter, the less people will enter it. Um, one of these experts told me about a contest that required a photo in a certain location and it only got like 300 people entering the contest. So those are always great. Uh, another tip is to stay local. Uh, local restaurants, bars, movie theaters are always putting on promotions and contests, and the pool of applicants is a lot smaller for those. Mm -hmm. um, general tips, always read the terms and conditions. There's a lot of lot of scams out there. Um, a famous one is if you see that free car in the mall, uh, we've written about this, but it's uh, you don't get a free car at all. They're just collecting your data, and they actually sell it to telemarketing companies. Yeah. Once you're in those systems, you can't escape. Um, to go along with that, you always want to set up a dedicated email um, for, for all the contests you enter. Don't give away your, your actual information. Um, and then, you know, using some of these aggregates to find opportunities. There are a lot of aggregates. Um, I Win Contests has one. Um, and what they do is they filter out these scammy contests and they find the opportunities that have the best odds and they kind of just compile a list and send it to you every few days. And, nice. uh, those have been vetted by the sweeper pros. So, right. right. The people who live and breathe sweeping. <laughs> uh, That's right. Cool. Zach, uh, really appreciate you coming on the show to tell us all about this. Uh, where can people follow all the work that you're doing online? That's the hustle.co. Uh, are, are you on Twitter? Yes. Uh, at ZZ Crockett. Um, on Twitter and uh, hustle.co uh, for, for other features and stories like this. I love it. Right on. Zach, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. It was appreciate nice it. talking with you. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Up next, a Texas town placed its hopes in the hands of cryptocurrency. And let's just say it hasn't necessarily panned out for them. But first, 
Uh, we're going to take a break and thank the sponsor. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Cashfly. You can give your users the seamless online experience that they want by powering your site or your app with Cashfly CDN. It's actually going to make you 30% faster than the competition. No matter what industry your business is in, if your website is directly tied to company revenue, you can give your customers the fast downloads that they need by using Cashfly. Cashfly CDN delivers rich media content up to 10 times faster than traditional delivery methods and up to 30% faster than other major CDNs. It's backed by a 100% SLA. Cashfly guarantees the best user experience for all your customers, no matter where they are or what device they're on. And you can join the thousands of others who trust Cashfly's reliable network, including LG, Microsoft, Adobe, Ars Technica, Leo Laporte. Oh, that's right, Leo Laporte here. Uh, we've been using Cashfly forever. <laughs> we've been hosting all our podcasts, our audio, our video on Cashfly for nearly a decade. And you know, you guys who watch and listen, uh, petabytes of data every single month to our viewers and our listeners, uh, fast, flawlessly. Twit simply would not exist without Cashfly. So. To say that we love Cashfly would be an understatement. Say goodbye to logging in multiple times a week or worse, even daily, uh, trying to track your CDN usage. You won't get billing spikes. You get a custom plan tailored to your CDN needs based on yearly usage trends. And on average, customers who switch to Cashfly save more than 20%. And you can imagine what you could do with 20% and your time. Uh, just for Twit listeners, Cashfly is giving away a complimentary detailed analysis of your current CDN bill and usage trends. You can see if you're overpaying 20% or more for CDN. Learn more at twit.cashfly.com. That's twit.cashfly.com. And we thank Cashfly for their support of Tech News Weekly. The town of Rockdale, Texas, was once a town with a thriving economy, local economy, thanks to a coal and energy. But once a local power plant shut down and a few other occurrences, a thousand workers found themselves unemployed and Rockdale's outlook was gloom. But that looked likely to change thanks to a different kind of mining cryptocurrency. And joining me to talk all about this is Mark Dent, writing for Wired's back channel. Welcome to the show, Mark. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's great to have you on. Thank you for hopping on today. So um, I guess let's start in the beginning as far as Rockdale is concerned. You know, most people probably aren't aware of Rockdale's history. What was happening there before the promise of Bitcoin uh, blew in a town? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So yeah, first of all, you know, Rockdale is a small town, about 5,000 people, about 60 miles or so east of Austin. So it's in, in central Texas. And so it, its history is back in 1950, uh, 1952, actually, Alcoa, the aluminum uh, company of America, uh, one of the biggest one of the biggest manufacturers out there, moved into town and and they built a smelting facility. And they did that because Rockdale had a seemingly endless you know supply of lignite coal under the ground. And and so with that coal, they were able to power the smelting facility and they produced aluminum. Uh, this created uh, thousands of jobs for the town. Uh, it helped the population. Like I mentioned, there's about 5,000 there now. Before Alcoa, there was maybe 2,500, maybe 2,000 or so. And so for about 50 years, uh, it was just this company town where they were very profitable. It had somewhat of a cosmo cosmopolitan sensibility because you had a lot of people moving in from the East Coast and the West Coast to, to work for Alcoa. And they all just lived in this town. And, and it was very successful until 2008 uh, when, when the Alcoa plant closed. And then obviously there was the, the Great Recession at that same time. Yeah. Then a coal plant shut down and two hospitals closed. It, it was just basically uh, there was about a decade of, of, just, of, of just bad things happening in this town and, and dire consequences for the people who lived there. Yeah, an exodus. And then uh, a company called Bitmain uh, started you know, showing their interest in, uh, in Rockdale. Who who is Bitmain? What's behind the company, and why were they? Why was Rockdale being selected for crypto mining specifically? Yeah, so, so Bitmain is one of the industry leaders in Bitcoin mining. They're they're involved with with various aspects of it. Uh, they th their biggest piece of business is they produce uh, these machines that are known as amp miners, and uh, these are basically the super fast running machines that. Uh, try to solve the puzzle that unlocks uh, the, the bitcoins that are available in the world, and and so they about seventy five percent of all uh, mining machines are are made by Bitmain. So they 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 are they are a power, and 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 then in addition to that, they also host other people's 
mining machines at, at different factories, and they build uh, mining facilities of their own. And prior to 2018, they had 11 of them and with about 200,000 total mining machines in them. And then last year in 2018, they decided that they were going to try out North America. And, and they saw Rockdale, Texas, because of the old Alcoa plant, there was just like this really, um, really easy, quick way to hook up to power uh, to where they wouldn't have to do a lot of work to make that happen. And they planned to build uh, what was going to be uh, what they told people was going to be the largest Bitcoin mining facility in the world. Is Texas a, a poor choice for something like this? Is there something geographically speaking or weather-wise that might make this a bad idea? Or was this a pretty sound plan? Well, it, it's definitely an odd choice. That's for sure. Um, it, it really just comes down to how cheap of electricity can you get? Uh, like Because Venezuela is actually a pretty good place for Bitcoin mining. And that's because Nicolas Maduro uh, essentially gives away free electricity. Uh, but, but Texas is odd because uh, it, it, it has open market electricity rates and they are about average for the United States. And then, like you mentioned, the weather, the climate here, as everyone knows, it, it gets so hot here in the summer, like unbelievably hot. And a, a large part of the electricity costs for uh, Bitcoin mining is keeping the machines cool. Right. Um, so that was so it, it was somewhat of a it, it was just very odd to just think that one of these huge Bitcoin mining facil facilities was going to be in Texas. But but that said, in many ways, China isn't all that uh, ideal of a place for Bitcoin mining either. And there are a lot of mining facilities out there. Sure. And I mean, a town like Rockdale, you know, understands that this company is going to come in, it's going to employ X number of, you know, have X number of jobs to offer to kind of a depressed local economy. Everybody's mm -hmm. got to be excited. But how much understanding was there around kind of the volatility that surrounds cryptocurrency, at least at this point in time? I don't think there was there was a whole lot. Uh, I, I think a lot most regular people in the town, first of all, they did have they had no idea. Right. Um, j just as like you know, the average American has no idea. Sure. If if not the, the very smartest of the smartest Americans, kind of have no idea. Yeah. And and so uh, you know, Bitmain they they came into town and uh, it, they had to have like a specialist come into like the city council just kind of to explain what cryptocurrency was. And, you know, this was a time in, in 2018, uh, Bitcoin's prices were starting to fall kind of steadily through that year. But it just wasn't really something that, that the town paid a lot of attention to because they were kind of focused on this great news. Like, like, like it seemed like they were chosen for like this new great technology. And, and, and it really does just it would be like a Silicon Valley company, like wanting to move to Rockdale, Texas is, is what it sounded like to them. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And what are the you know, everybody kind of seeing the potential, you know, development of this over time and thinking, well, it can turn yeah. into this, it can turn into that. Suddenly we would have a, you know, a, a, a thriving local economy. Well, that didn't happen. As you said, Bitcoin prices fell throughout 2018. Did this plan entirely evaporate at that point? Is there a possibility that it comes back? And how have they, how have they been able to kind of survive this, this wave at this point? Yeah. So what would happen was when the, the, the Bitcoin crashes, uh, sorry, when the Bitcoin per Bitcoin prices really fell toward the end of 2018 in November, which was known as the Bitcoin winter. Uh, it fell very suddenly from about 6,500 to 3,000. And the break even point for mining is, is around five or 6,000, even for very efficient miners. So it was just like, it was, it was terrible the, the, for, for Bitmain and, and for many other mining companies. But, but, but Bitmain, uh, from, from what I was told, had to lay off around 80% of its employees globally. Uh, that included, um, so what had happened at, at Rockdale was they had signed uh, an abatement, uh, meaning that they were going to get basically 80% off their taxes for five years and then a little bit more for the next five years uh, because that's how much Rockdale wanted them there. And that was contingent on them providing at least 350 jobs within those first five years. And it was thought they'd maybe even provide 600. So, uh, but, you know, that was signed. Then in November, December, some work did get started at the mining facility, but 14 people had been hired. And then there was a hiring freeze. And then nine of those 14 people got laid off. Uh, so this facility was supposed to open in early 2019. That didn't happen. Uh, it is now supposed to open later this month, possibly. And it will have maybe uh, what, you know, what the town government uh, estimates is maybe 20 jobs, maybe 40 jobs eventually. So 
it is still probably going to happen and, and there's going to be a facility there to some extent, but it, but it's not going to be this like uh, real major job creator. And it's not going to be sort of this prideful thing also. Like there was kind of with Alcoa, there was some, there was a lot of pride in, in Rockdale uh, because of the work that was done there and, and because it was such a big factory and, and people, they were going to be kind of prideful about this too. Uh, and having like such a, a major facility and such a high tech industry. And, and it just doesn't quite feel that way now. Yeah. And I mean, you know, the, the potential, the long-term potential around, around crypto is, you know, it, it really could go in any direction. Yeah. What we're seeing right now is this kind of this fluctuation, this volatility that's almost, you know, unbearable to, to consider creating a company around unless you know for a fact that you can weather that storm. And so, yep. you know, times are, times are better now than they were you know, six months ago, as far as Bitcoin price, you know, specifically, but that could obviously change very wildly. Yeah. It's hard, it's hard to think that a, that a, a, uh, you know, a region could place all of its bets into it at this point, maybe somewhere down the line, but yeah, I think, I think that's exactly right. Like it's, it's so volatile that you, you don't know what's going to happen. Like there could be, it could fall literally, uh, by $3,000 tomorrow. And, and you don't really, most people are just trading Bitcoin or, uh, maybe spending it here and there you don't really think about like the possible human cost because there's not a whole lot of jobs in the, in the industry right now, but, but those that are, they, they, they could just come and go super quickly, just like it did for Bitmain last year. Like re remember it was about 80% of, of employees for that company, like lost their jobs. And wow. uh, the other thing to remember is that with these Bitcoin mining facilities is that even in, even while Bitcoin is doing well, it's unlikely to produce that many jobs. The, the number uh, that was estimated of 350, or, or that was that was actually promised, and an estimate of possibly 600, uh, just doesn't. It just doesn't really add up. When you look at some of the biggest mining facilities that are successful here in the United States, like there's some in Washington, uh, where there will maybe be 15 employees, 15 or 20, and and it's just uh, it, it just doesn't seem like it's going to be a field that's going to create like a large amount of jobs like manufacturing did 50 years ago. Right. Right. Maybe someday. Uh, Mark Dent, you, you wrote for back channel on wired. Is this where your work can be found normally or where can people follow you online? Uh, you, you should follow me on Twitter at M dent. Oh five. Um, I write, um, I write all over the place. So right on. Cool. It was an awesome article and I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, come on and talk about it. Thank you so much, Mark. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. We'll talk to you soon. Yep. All right, and finally, uh, you've likely realized by now that my most amazing co-host, Megan Maroney, is no longer working with us here at Twit. Mm, I don't want to cry. She found an awesome job at Medium, which if you've been following the show for a long time, you know that she's always been a huge fan of Medium, so it really seems like a perfect fit. Uh, of course, I miss her around here, and her high fives are second to none. Megan, I wish you the best in your new adventures, and let's grab some lunch and high five after we pay the bill. Now... At the end of the month, a new host will be working with me full time here, and he joins me now to say, "Hey, welcome to the show and the Twit Network, Micah Sargent. How you doing, Micah? Oh, I'm doing so well. Here's a <laughs> high five for you across ah! the internet. All right, that works for me from my vantage point. But there we go. <laughs> Beautiful. Yes, there we go. <laughs> so first things first, you are a big fan of the Internet of Things. So. Uh, we were kind of talking leading up to the show, thought we'd bring you on to kind of talk about something you're interested in, then maybe get to know you a little bit more so that, because you're going to be on the show, you're going to be co-hosting Tech News Weekly in a matter of a couple of weeks along with me. And I'm super thrilled that you will, but let's start with IOT. Um, I'm a home, home owner, so mm -hmm. I've had no qualms in installing things into my house to kind of smarten it up. Some things are easier to install than others, but that might not necessarily be the case for renters. It sounds like you have some tips for uh, renters who are looking to make their smart home or their home rental a smart rental. Uh, what you got? Well, first of all, if you're a homeowner, don't brag about it. Oh, no, I'm sorry. kidding. <laughs> I Dang own it. my home and I can do whatever I want. No, I kid, I kid. Um, I think that, you know, for, for renters, a lot of times, you know, that's a, a big swath of the market and yeah. continues to be a big swath of the market. There's that joke about millennials not buying homes. There's a reason for that. I don't own a home. I am going to be renting an apartment, a, a town home to be precise. And I'm a little bit nervous about switching from uh, Missouri to California 
sort of laws and regulations and oversight and things like that. Yeah. Uh, because I've talked about being a renter and a smart home enthusiast before, and it's a whole lot different in Missouri. When you look, uh, if you if you slap down a lease in Missouri, it doesn't really make a sound on the table. But if you slap down a lease in California, I'm pretty sure it starts an earthquake, like all the way in LA from Petaluma. Yeah. Those leases are super big and they're full of different regulations and rules and stuff like that. And so that all plays into it. And so I'm kind of um, learning myself going from a place where I was renting and like the landlord is one person and he or she and I are like, friends who occasionally walk our dogs together on the weekend or something like that to a place where it's a big company. You're talking to a local representative as opposed to talking to the homeowner themselves. Mm -hmm. And so whereas before I could install fun things like this, uh, which is a Lutron switch. Uh, it's actually a dimmer unit um, that lets you turn on and off lights and then dim up and down. Yeah, uh, this that. goes directly into the wall. And, you know, it's got these these wires in the background where you're basically having to uh, turn off the power at the breaker and take out your existing uh, lights. This one's even more complicated. This is a Kugeek. It is a very interesting product because it actually is two gang. And so oh, I was okay. able to control in one switch both a light and a fan, turning those on and off. So this was this came in handy quite uh, quite a bit in my house. But gone are these things <laughs> because <laughs> they require in-wall work, which requires access to the breaker, which requires a little bit more involvement. And in our simpler products like TP links, little, uh, simple, smart plug. I you have plug that it one. into the wall. Yeah, oh, okay, that yeah. Like plug that, that bad boy into the wall, and you got Wi-Fi connection right there. You can plug whatever you want into it. And then something like Philips Hue bulbs, yeah, which those. are connected to your router. I love the Hue just, bulbs. They're, they're great. They're, they're a so, little pricey, but I love them. Yeah, and, and they continue to drop in price, which is nice. And yeah. I think that there are some pretty good deals right now um, because Hugh always does does pretty good deals. Um, if you can't find deals on your normal sites, like say Amazon or Best Buy, uh, my tip is to always go to the Hue website because I was able to get like 12 Philips Hue white bulbs for very little money. And so I just have a bunch of Philips Hue white bulbs that if I ever need to put them somewhere, <laughs> I can. Um, you've, you've, you've bought in advance of actually needing to use them, which actually, if you find a good deal is not, it is a very smart approach. You're probably yeah, going to find a use for them eventually. Yeah, at some point I'll have enough uh, <laughs> lamps in my house to use them. But kind of, kind of going back a little bit, sort of talking about the difference between you know this and and this. Yeah. Um, before that, though, let's talk about you know paying attention to your lease and having a conversation with your the person that is is renting the property to you, because it's going to depend um, on. The lease, of course, and the legal lease involved in the lease, but also just the conversations and the the things that you're allowed to do uh, according to what the landlord or person that is renting you the property says. Because right. I've known folks who have been able to install, say, a smart thermostat, and then they installed the smart thermostat and their uh, landlord came at the end of the lease and, you know, did the the landlord walk through to determine what other security deposit was going to go back to them, et cetera, et cetera. And because the lease had a statement in it that said uh, any additions to the property uh, then become the property of the person leasing the house, they had to leave their smart thermostat <sighs> behind. So they didn't have a conversation with their landlord ahead of time. And so it was kind of by the letter of the lease as opposed to any sort of agreement that took place. So it's just important that you have those conversations because you might get stuck leaving things behind if you decide to be clever and sort of go outside of the bounds of the lease or the agreement that you have. Um, always talk. I mean, it's it's not fun, but shoot an email to your landlord or if you do walk your dogs with your landlord on the weekends, have a conversation with them and see uh, what they're okay with, what they're not Every time I've rented a property here in Missouri, it's always been, 
hey, as long as everything gets back to the way it was when you moved in at the end of the lease, right. I don't care what you do. Right. And so for me, that I, I kind of got lucky in that sense because I was able to install all sorts of things and just swap that stuff back out and put um, old things back in. And so a, uh, a really important tip that I have there is make sure that when you decide to go through and smarten up your rental property, if you have been given this opportunity, make sure that you save those bulbs and the thermostat and the this and the that that the landlord has added to the house. Label those things, organize them really well. Because I just had two boxes, uh, two banker's boxes that I was able to go to and say, okay, here's everything that I need. I found out, you know, I had the label of this is the room that it came from. This is the lumen of the bulb. This is the fixture that it went into, et cetera, et cetera. So it was very easy to go in and install. And then I had photos saved of the proper wiring for my thermostat, et cetera. So as long as you're kind of um, making sure that you have everything documented properly and you have those conversations and you make sure that your lease and what you're doing sort of line up with what your expectations are, then you're going to be, you're going to be okay. It's just important to pay attention to all of those things because you don't want to end up uh, in violation of your lease or something no. like that. Or like I said, leaving your smart thermostat behind because you agreed to it in your lease that new changes to the property were the property of the, the person leasing the property. Yeah. There's a lot of properties there. Yeah, I, I like your your tip on on kind of like taking pictures of of the the wiring and everything because that's something that's been really helpful for me. Sometimes I'll I'll remove something with the intention to maybe put it back or you know, and if I don't have that picture, you know, countless times I've not taken the picture and then I end up getting everything all disassembled and I'm like, damn it, now I can't. I I don't know. Maybe it was <laughs> the red one. You know, you start doubting yeah. yourself and that's suddenly it becomes infinitely things. harder. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's yeah. I used to do that. And then I finally, finally learned my lesson. And so at this point I take, you know, a dozen photos for every single thing so that I know exactly where it goes. And I've got little albums in my uh, iCloud photo library that are just specific to these different products. Yeah. And they're, you know, taken from different angles, from uh, zoomed out, zoomed in. Some of them I've even annotated with labels so that everything I know exactly where it went so I can easily put it back together again. Because nice. I did that too many times and then was suddenly, you know, digging into some, uh, <laughs> some, some deep web PDF manuals for uh, home builders and things like that to try and find whatever it was that I needed to fix. All right. So we've, we've now learned that you both like IOT and you're incredibly organized. Uh, these are two <laughs> things that I know about you right now. So, um, given that you're going to soon be a permanent fixture on tech news weekly, which I am super excited about, uh, what else should we know about you? Where are you from? What was your life before podcasting? I don't know what you got. Yeah. Um, so I am originally from the place that I'm reporting from now. It's St. Joseph, Missouri. Uh, many people have heard of Kansas City, Missouri. Yeah. And it's just about 50 minutes north of Kansas City, Missouri. Um, it is, you know, it's a, it's a town. I wouldn't call it a city per se. Um, and technically, technically, I'm not from here because I was born in an ambulance on the highway on the way to the hospital. And so that <laughs> at the time that ambulance was uh, in Stewartsville, Missouri, but St. Joseph is where my family uh, settled down. So that's where I consider myself to be from. Um, I have lived in California. I went to kindergarten in California, actually. How was it? And, and uh, <laughs> yeah, I was. It was so. It was. I've in heard kindergarten in California is great. Yeah, you know, it was. Uh, I don't remember much of it other yeah. than it was very hot, and it was. It's closer to L.A. or maybe San Diego. It was Oceanside, California. Okay. Um, and it was on a military base, so it was uh, a whole different experience, but. It was, a, it was a good time nonetheless, yeah. and I had the biggest crush on my teacher, and uh, she was such a sweetheart. And I could still, to this day, remember old Mrs. Wheeler. She was a, a great teacher. <laughs> um, I've lived in North Carolina, and then pretty much from then on have been in Missouri in one city or another. Um, before podcasting, um, while I was still in college, I started a job at a company called Newsy. Uh, Newsy is an online video news service 
and it reports on all sorts of, of news, be it uh, technology, politics. You know, it's just it's like NBC or CNN or any of those other ones, except it is a uh, very small bite sized video forward oh, okay. uh, type of type of service. And so I started out as a writer there um, and a video producer and then started anchoring for that uh, for the company and from that point on, um, moved from sort of just having those those different small roles to taking on uh, Newsy's overall tech coverage. So I led a team of, of tech writers there and sort of shaped Newsy's tech coverage while also doing uh, lots of anchoring. And a fun fact there, um, we had many different clients across the internet. And so we would do videos for those partners. And one of the things that we would do were recaps of reality television shows because people loved the next day to be able to see, oh, what happened on Real Housewives or what happened on um, the, the show where they... They, they bid on those uh, storage units that nobody is claiming. Oh, oh, storage Wars. What is that? Yeah, Storage Wars, yes. Storage right. Wars. And so I've never watched any <laughs> of those shows, but I would have to anchor the little recaps of these stories. And so we would have you know people who were literally hired to watch these shows and then write up a recap of it. And then I would go in and I would anchor this, you know, this short little script uh, that would get turned into a video. And so oftentimes I would get feedback from people who viewed, who thought that I knew who the heck insert person's name here on Real Housewives of, of Madison County. Yeah. And that was, that was actually quite a bit of fun uh, because kind of the amount of feedback I got told me how well I was doing at faking enthusiasm <laughs> for these shows I never saw. Uh, so I mean, that was a good time. I think that's a, that's a format that happens a lot on, on TV or, you know, the person that's actually talking, sometimes they have a whole team of people coming up with the information. They're just like, you know, uh, I'm, I'm Ron Burgundy, you know, that whole moment. <laughs> um, my name? Yeah. So, uh, so what shows are you doing right now? Because you're going to still be doing some of the podcasts that you're already doing uh, yeah. once you move over here. Is that right? Yes, that's true. So uh, you were just on. Thank you for, for joining us. Yeah, um, that's fine. Kind of my my main other podcast that I do uh, for the Relay FM network, and it's called Clockwise. Um, it's a 30-minute, never longer than 30 minutes show with uh, four people that kind of go, each person brings a topic to the table and it sort of goes around in a circle. Everybody uh, talks about each topic. Uh, I also do a show on Jason Snell's The Incomparable Network, and it is called Somehow I Manage. It is a podcast I do with Tiffany Arment where we talk about the NBC a sitcom, The Office, and we pretty much are just watching every episode and wow. talking about the episode in each uh, each episode of the show. That's um, a lot of episodes. Those, yeah, that yes, and we're on like season four, I think, right now. Um, so we're not even all the way through this first time around, and it'll be interesting to see what we do, uh, you know, the next time around. And yeah. then the other show that I do, uh, it's called Unhelpful Suggestions. I do that show with my pal Joe Rosenstiel. And it's a tech podcast. Uh, Joe and I are both queer folks. And so it kind of brings, you know, it's not your your standard uh, everyday classic American podcast that you're probably used to listening to of, of uh, three or four dudes just uh, talking about about the latest in tech. So right, right. Uh, that's kind of fun to have a little bit of diversity there. Absolutely. Uh, and that that pretty much covers it. You know, there there are some other side projects here and there, but those are the ones that I do regularly. Right on, cool. Um, uh, any pets? Favorite color? <laughs> uh, you know, we got we got to know all about you. Yeah. So favorite color is green. Right. Um, that's absolutely. A, that's a, that's a respectable been. color. Yeah, I like that color. Green's good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's been my favorite color since as long as I can remember and as long as my family can remember, they've confirmed that I've always said green was my favorite color. Um, I have two pets, uh, a chihuahua. His name's Henry. He's a full-bred chihuahua. He's five years old. Uh, and then, Or he'll turn five in November. And then I have a chihuahua rat terrier mix. Her name is Mizzy. And I adopted her. The reason people are like, Mitzi? I say, no, it's Mizzy. Um, the folks who I adopted her from, they were big fans of the University of Missouri, which was the university that uh -huh. I attended. 
their colors are black and gold and Mizzy is a black and sort of a goldish brown color. So that's where the name Mizzy comes from. Nice. Um, and she will be six or she turned six in June. So they are, you know, they're not too old, not too young. Um, but Mizzy is funny because she, she's a pretty anxious dog. And so she's got more gray hairs than I do, um, <laughs> frankly. And it's, it's kind of funny seeing it on, on, a young woman, <laughs> all the great hairs that she has. <laughs> well, I can't wait to meet your dogs. I'm sure they'll be in. We, we bring our dogs into the into the studio from time to time. So uh, I'm sure you will meet my dog, Sugar. Uh, also Yay! kind of a little bit of an anxious dog at times, but uh, they'll get along famously, I'm sure. Uh, favorite piece of technology from your childhood? When you look back on your childhood, what's the piece of tech that you're just like, oh, oh man, I love that thing? It's going to have to be, I don't even know what the model number of this webcam was, but it was some crappy Logitech webcam because I would go out to my grandparents' house. They lived in the country, as we say in Missouri, um, and I would make stop motion videos with this webcam. So I would, you know, solve a Rubik's Cube or have the Rubik's Cube solve itself. Oh, with like, cool. Yes. Da, 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 music behind it and yep. have little Gumbies walking around and stuff. And so I remember having so much fun with that webcam, uh, making all sorts of different little videos and, and showing them to, to family and seeing, you know, what they thought about it. That's rad. I did the same exact thing when I was a kid, but it was with a Aww. big, big camcorder. Like, you know, back in the <laughs> days of where your camera like literally rested on your shoulder. Like it was like, oh, like I'm going to pull out my box. camera for the, the, the home movie you know, moment. And it's this like huge like, cannon. <laughs> uh, but I would set that up and do stop motion stuff as well. So uh, that that's fun. awesome. Do you still have those videos? You know, I bet if I look for them somewhere, I could find them. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if they're still there somewhere. You got to keep uh, certainly those. Other, certainly other videos that I did when I was younger yeah. are around, including one of, it wasn't one that I did, but um, my grandparents loved to show people this video of me dancing as a little kid. <laughs> and uh, they were very fond of recording lots and lots of video of of <laughs> me saying ridiculous things as a child. Ah, yes. And in the uh, the internet age, none of that dies. It all lives on forever. It's all there forever. <laughs> uh, final question is very important. High five or fist bump? Well, it's going to have to be a high five, obviously. All right. All right cool. All right. All right. You're in. You, you yes, passed the test. I, <laughs> I was nervous. Mike, I'm super stoked uh, for you to start on the show here in a couple of weeks and for you to be here working with us in the studio. Thank you for hopping on today. Really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Can't yeah. wait. Cool. Um, and then, of course, you're you're on the Twitters and stuff. Where can people follow you there? You can find me on Twitter and other social media at Micah Sargent, or you can head to chihuahua.coffee. That's C-H-I-H-U-A-H-U-A dot coffee. That has links to all the different things I do. And I need to update it with my new Twit stuff. So uh, if you head there looking for Twit, then you're going to have to wait just a second. But chihuahua.coffee. I was not expecting chihuahua.coffee. Uh, <laughs> I feel like I need to like update your lower third now, but we're going we're gonna to go with what we got. Micah, thank you so much, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Yeah, see you soon. <laughs> Take care, man. Bye. All right, Tech News Weekly records live every, usually every Thursday at 11 a.m. Pacific at twit.tv slash live. Uh, you can be part of the show by emailing us at tnw at twit.tv. Of course, subscribe to our show by going to twit.tv slash tnw. You can follow us online uh, on all the socials, Twitter, Instagram, everything. Twit is all over the place. And if you want to find me directly, you can. I'm at Jason Howell on Twitter. Thanks to everyone who helps us do this show uh, today. It's John, John, and Burke. And I'm sure there's other people who have poked their heads in here. Anthony, I think it was in here earlier. He was trying to give me a drink, uh, like a coffee or something. And I turned him down. So I'm sorry, Anthony. It's nothing personal. Uh, you're great. Uh, but thank you for watching. We'll see you next week on another episode of Tech News Weekly. Bye, everybody. <laughs>